in the middle podcast uh, hello landon hello ryan it's great to see you and hello justin hey guys um so justin on season two we've been bringing in different people uh to kind of contribute to this conversation and it's almost like it's running two parallel conversations which is really neat and something we weren't expecting where hmm. we kind of carrying over from season one we're talking about big ideas like god and religion and ethics and whatnot and finding people that have really interesting things to say in that space but we we kind of noticed like halfway through season one um that not only is there opportunity to talk about the things that matter in life and try to find common ground but there's a certain set of skills that we need as well and i'm 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 hoping and anticipating today our conversation maybe kind of does a little bit of both um, but we usually like to start out by asking people, like, I could list off, you know, all of your roles and titles and the projects that you've been involved in. Um, but very specifically, like in your last book, there was a chapter where you talked about um, being labeled and how you don't always appreciate that. So we wanted to give you an opportunity, like, how do you like to talk about yourself? How do you like to tell people oh, who you are? Um. I've come to say something along the lines of because usually when people ask that question, they mostly they're mostly talking about like the work, like the work of one's life. I mean, like mm -hmm. in some settings, just I I'm supposed to say, and I would say naturally, like I'm a dad. That's probably my favorite part of life is being a dad. Um, I think contextually, when people ask like who you are, want to know who you are, it, they're always everyone's always coming through some kind of filter. It's like, what does it mean to me, right? So in, so in some contexts, like I'm supposed to say dad. Professionally, I've come to honestly say this and mean it, is uh, I'm really honestly just trying to help people find their way. Um, that's what, what do you do? I, I am doing my best to like help people find their way. And that's kind of the, the, the best answer I've got right now. I used to wanna say I'm a pastor uh, and what I would mean by that was something really was something much broader than that term, than that term would it like uh, apply to a conversation. Um, and then when I started doing more coaching, I would say like I'm I'm kind of a coach. And again, that would sort of like narrow the like oh that's what this means. Mm. Part of why and this is part of why like, I I don't shun labels because I test as an Enneagram four and I want to be special. I I try to. Uh, I try to open up conversations because one of the ways I help or one of the ways I can help is I try to reorient people to the language we, they, we use because it shapes the way we engage with the world. And so mm -hmm. I'd rather open the door to a conversation about who I am uh, and therefore, and, and in that context, a conversation about, about what I do. So I get to be that annoying guy at the party who's like not answering straight questions because I'm working. <laughs> so what, what do you do? I just try to help people find their way. And the people oh, are like, what the funny. hell does that mean? I'm like, well, let's get into that. Well, I'll do that in a number of different ways. And so, uh, yeah, that's why like the labels thing, especially at this point, uh, and in most of the context I live in, in, you know, Ryan, you know this real well, and Landon knows this too. Like if you throw out the word pastor, I've already sacrificed four or five conversations that aren't going to happen from there because right. they've already come to a crap ton of conclusions. Um, and they don't even mean to have done that. It's just like I've known two pastors and they were both cheats and jerks or this is what pastors do. Like I've already sacrificed ground in conversation and I'd rather spend time rebuilding words uh, than you know, giving them over to prior assumptions. I love that. I love how you didn't answer the question, <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> but it led into further conversation. That's why we're here. We um, so I'll give a little bit of, of uh, the backstory here cool. um, that has to relate to our relationship. And as I'm doing that, Landon, you can kind of think of like the first question that you want to like kind of lead us off with. Okay. So, um, so I think I've told this story a little bit before, but a couple of years back um, kind of, at the height of the pandemic, sort of, I was supposed to take my sabbatical. It wasn't going to happen for me to get out of the country. So um, I went up to the mountains of North Carolina for a week uh, with the blessing of the elders at the time, just to do some kind of interior work and figure out like what's going on inside of me because my world, like everybody's world, had radically shifted. And 
even as you're, you're you know you're talking about that word pastor like the pandemic raised a lot of questions that many of us normally wouldn't have had to ask because we could just kind of maintain the status quo and um through a lot of reading and a lot of hiking and prayer and journaling uh i came back and i told my elders uh, i need reinforcements like hmm. I I feel like I'm, I've already been playing jazz up to this point in my career, um, but I I need I need people in my corner. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was when I uh, first got myself a therapist, and then um, when I found you doing the pastoral coach stuff. But it's funny, like even as you're talking about coach, and as you're saying, like that feels limiting. Like it doesn't it doesn't really feel like that's the relationship either. Like. Sometimes I refer to you as my coach, sometimes as a spiritual director, um, and sometimes just as, as, a, as a friend. And uh, so we've been working together for two and a half years now, um, meeting monthly. And um, one of my favorite things is we don't see eye to eye on everything. Um, the perspective you bring to me is so refreshing. Like, for example, like mm. I'm probably much more of an institutionalist than you are. Um, but your the way in which you uh, so uh, kindly but sternly ask me the right questions and you find the thing to be able to poke at to get me to hmm. be thinking about where I'm at, what's going on inside of me and how I'm presenting myself to the world has been invaluable. And even kind of when we started working together, the biggest challenge you brought to me was, well, what do you want? Which is my least favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't want to answer that question. I want someone to tell me. I want the rainbow in the sky with the bald eagle that flies across it to give me the sign from God that like this is the next thing or whatever. And so a lot of our work and our relationship over the past few years has been kind of around that. Um, But also watching um, the way that you maneuver social media spaces um, you do a lot of that. And and um, if anybody knows Justin's work, especially on Instagram, it's a lot of, um, it's a, it, it is, it's words that provoke or are meant to incite or invite something rather than kind of a conclusion or an answer or something that closes off a conversation. Uh, and that's something I've always really appreciated about your work. Um, and part of why I'm excited to talk to you today and, and kind of formally introduce you to Landon, you know, you've known about our work kind of in proxy for a while, mm-hmm. um, is that I don't necessarily expect us to like walk away with clean answers, but maybe at the least some really good questions or things to ponder. So that's kind of my hopes for today. Love it. I love that. Yeah. No clean answers, just dirty questions. <laughs> love dirty it. Questions. Dirty questions. Um, all right. Let's start off with a big question then. Um, and maybe we'll see where we have opportunities to zoom in a little bit. You've had a lot of experience in the church and various facets and roles. And now as you know, you're playing this coaching kind of director role and still, it seems like kind of in that community in different ways, like what is your, if you were to kind of take a step back what is the question that the Christian church is asking? Like if you were to try to kind of define the moment we're in for the church and whether you want to define that as being kind of nested in our cultural moment, I know this is a big, <laughs> a big question, but Great. just give us a sense, maybe just start us off by giving us a sense of like, when you look out from your vantage point, what's the landscape that you see? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think there's the question that, um, I think there's a, I'm going to say several things. So I think there's a question that a lot of, that a majority of uh, mainline and evangelical church leaders are asking one. I think there's, a, I think there are a couple questions that I wish, I don't want to say should, I'll just say that I wish uh, my sisters and brothers were asking. Uh, and then there's a kind of a third facet to this. So the question I, I, I'm hearing a lot uh, is like, how do we make it or how do we fix this? Um, like, how do we, can we, can we get through this? How do we make it? How do we fix this? That there are these obstacles, these moments, there's the, we've, you know, it, it's no longer necessarily about like the, um, 
what's it, like, like the culture wars that you know people talk about like the you know cultural tsunamis and like and and, and then there was the 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 pandemic and the whole and the question a primary question i heard asked in and in, in different forms is like how how do we make it how do we fix it hmm. um the problem i have with that question is i don't think there's enough reflection on the it part of that question because i don't think you know what the hell it is and i don't think you've known that for a long time i think you assume and this is again the problem with labels i think you assume you know what it is and you want to save or fix or recover it or push it through meanwhile the questions i wished we were asking were things like what's real about this what's good about this and maybe good would be more would be even better framed in, uh, in, the, in the context of, of helpfulness so what's real about this like what's actually not just true because the word truth gets us in all kinds of religious weird corners but what's real about this uh about what we have in our hands culturally institutionally uh spiritually and then what's what's good about this and the good of, and this is where I think Ryan and I will probably align in, with regards to institutionalism, is if you're if what you've built institutionally does not offer a good, a value, to not just the people in it but to the people around it, then it it's problematic. Yeah. There isn't a ton of middle ground there with regards to religious institutions. You're either helpful, or you are problematic. Um, and so it, it, those are the questions I wish we were asking. Because uh, those are really good questions, and I think those were the things that that have been exposed through the culture wars and the cultural tsunamis. Uh, there are things that are real about what we have um, that aren't good, and that keep us. I'm throwing myself in with everybody. That keep us from actually being good and being helpful. And that's the moment I think we're actually in. Is like I think we want to be good. I think that's why we're here. It's a ridiculously difficult job to run a church. Uh, it's a difficult thing to be a part of a community of people who are you know, binded together in mystery and liturgy. And if it's worth it, it's worth it because it's good. And we're just not examining the goodness of the thing, the way we're being, I think, asked to and invited into, into doing right now. Yeah. I, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. There was, it's funny because like in a lot of these conversations, especially early on when Lane and I were talking, his questions would come back to me of like, well, how is that useful? Yeah. And I hated that. <laughs> yeah, uh, so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> Why? But we, um, because what I heard, and this wasn't, it took us, how long did it take us? It let, took us like a year and a half, Landon, I think, to like break through the log jam. Yeah. What he was asking for was like, I don't know, the fancy word might be like efficacy yeah. or like the, the, like there has to be some sort of utility. Um, you, well, even, I think that's where I got stuck. Cause I got stuck in like utilitarian, like something is good because something's useful because of the product and the source doesn't matter. That's I think where I kind of got stuck, but once we started to kind of push past that, one of the, the the best things for me in this whole project has been reflecting back on what is the what is the natural outpouring of the things that I claim that are true. Yep. Like in like capital G goodness, not just like yep. utility, because I don't I think we can run into a problem when we approach spirituality and say, Well, is it useful to me? Mm. Where I've already decided what I think my life is about and what yes. I want out of it. So I'm not, I'm not approaching truth or goodness with any expectation of change. I only want to be reinforced in what yeah. I already believe now, but to, I've had to kind of make that shift. And a lot of the way forward that Lan and I have found out is like, it can be useful, not in the sense that it just keeps me where I'm at, but we, you step into it with this expectation. I'm, I will yep. change yep. and I, and I will grow. And part of what is good is stepping into some sort of unknown and, yep. and seeking it out and trying it. 
and that actually being that's what's good about it yeah see i think utilitarianism is deeply problematic in in like a, a personal interpersonal processes and journeys uh like the question i'm with you 100 percent. like it, you know what what good is it or is it useful to me is that begin that's rooted in a conclusion i've come to about what's good for me and that that posture lacks the humility that a truly spiritual journey uh you know is, is postured in but the minute i'm going to drop a million dollars on a building and and then and then and then pay someone to get up in front of somewhere between 40 and 40,000 people every week to tell the truth i have made some conclusions hmm. um and this is like institutionalism and it sh and should and this is how it should work is if you come to it as we come to know things or really truly believe things in this way then for god's sake build something absolutely hmm. like go for it absolutely do that just know that that's what you're doing know that you're building something on these conclusions you've come to and as you do that, one of one of the metrics then you give into is is it useful? Because if you're going to spend a million dollars, and if you're going to pay a staff, and you're going to invite people into the space, you've made some declarations about your your usefulness. It's not a negative. It's and it's not everything. But if you're going to build a thing, you must at least assume that you have something to offer. And a way, if not the primary way to measure that is like, is it useful? So if I'm not a member of your tribe and someone's like inviting me, hey, come to this thing, the, the immediate thing is, does it add value to my life? Does it, does it matter to me? The, the way we, I think, mean that is like, is this useful to me? Hmm. Um, usefulness, is, uh, usefulness is a really problematic metric if I'm trying to come to like a root sense of my human identity. Usefulness is a necessary metric if I'm going to build something institutionally and say that it's worth the, my time investment, much less tell you that it's worth yours. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned there the word value, and I think that's where I came to kind of rephrase that question a little bit because it's a question about value, right? It's like, yes, usefulness, as you just talked about, has its its place, but like the the real root of that question is like, what does that do? It's really like a rephrasing of so what, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, how totally. does that, what difference does that make? How does that yeah. transform me or us? Like what, yeah, what is the result if I go along with what, <laughs> what or you're even if it's not, if I and it doesn't an even have to just be a result. Yeah. I mean, Seth, Seth Godin's yeah, yeah. most recent book, it's called The Practice. It's a great book. Almost everything he, I think it's a great book because <laughs> I'm just a fanboy. Yeah. He's just he's such a fanboy, and part of what he gets into with regards to like healthy practice is like don't don't wait till the very end of your of your practice and your process to ask this question. At every phrase, at every, at every phase, beginning and end, ask the question: What's it for? What's this for? In the in the practice in the process, and again, you know, you know, folks who've been around the church a lot, boy, that would have been a great question to ask mm -hmm. before we started a youth program. What's it for? Hmm. Like, you're just supposed to start a youth program. What, what, like, what's the and you know, to Landon's phrase, like, what's the value of that culturally? What's it for? You know, is is exactly that. Like, so what? Like, what what's it for? What's the purpose of the thing? That's a brilliant question to ask and. I, and super clarifying, mm -hmm. especially especially now in this moment. <laughs> you want to rebuild yeah. the thing. You want to save it. You want to push it through. You want to make sure you get through the other side of this cultural season and a democratic White House. Okay, for what? Like, what's the what's the value of you making it through? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it's it's something that the pandemic has uh apocalypsed right yes. like especially for nice verb. a lot you like that word verb <laughs> well so you know this coming this coming week at church Justin and i were talking about this earlier today um we're we're kind of doing this you know like find seeking a word or phrase that guides our year personally and so in january 2020 i came to that sunday blank slate let's just see what i feel like the lord's saying and i I had some ideas in my mind or something maybe about joy or something like that. 
and I heard the word apocalypse and I'm like, that's kind of weird. Okay. Um, and the word, you know, we, it conjures up like, you know, Dante's Inferno or any number of Hollywood movies, but the word actually means to reveal or unveil. So it's not like the end of something. It's the, the breaking open and revealing something that was hidden, but is now out front. Yep. And I, I feel like not just for religious communities, but for a lot of our status quo institutions, there's at least been that invitation to see what's been apocalypsed. Now, whether or not we're taking that invitation is a different story. Yeah. From um, institution to institution or community to community. Um, because it's not easy. Those are scary questions to ask. They're very scary questions to ask because they go to root things. There, I'm going to geek right. out here for a second on this, on this reflection, like super geek out. Like when I say geek out, I actually mean it. Um, go, Justin. The... Uh, Battlestar Galactica, um, I'll just Here say the phrase it. first. So towards the tail end of the most uh, of the more recent Battlestar series, uh, one of the Cylons is having a conversation um, with the captain. And she says, you know, humanity is constantly trying to figure out how, like, how to survive and you know, like, how to survive. How, and they never, and, but they've never asked the question of like, why should you? You've never asked the question, why should you survive? Mm. There are so many reasons I like that TV show. That's just one of them. <laughs> I've watched that three season thing like probably four times. That moment, um, especially at the, the point at which I was watching it, um, that that is, if I was just going back to Landon's initial question, like what's the what is the question people are uh, you know what is the question being asked? And I'm saying like what are the questions I wish it was asked? The the value of institutionalized religious practice in a Christian context. Like we want to survive. I totally understand and want to survive. Do you want to survive because you invested so much damn time, energy, money in the thing? Or do you want to survive because it's actually valuable in the broadest kingdom sense? You know, when we talk about the kingdom of God, the, is it actually valuable in that sense? That question mm -hmm. rarely gets asked because of how much time, energy, money we've put into the things that we've built. Um, but it is the question, like, sh should this, th should the it, I want it to survive. Should, should it, should it survive? Um, that's a, that's a scary question for a lot of folks. I think it's for, uh, it is actually the question other people, people who aren't invested in the institution are asking. And a lot mm -hmm. of them are coming to the conclusion. No, like tax them out of existence is like, it's a thing I, I, mean, I live in the San Francisco area. Like. I live around folks who would like to watch institutionalized religious spaces be taxed out of existence. Just squeeze these people for as much money as we can get out of them, get all that property back so we can have it back because it's not worthwhile to us for that much ground to be given over to this religious practice. And if other people around us are asking the question, like, should they survive? Then we should ask that same question. Hmm. So what is, if the answer to that presumably is, Yes, something should survive, that there's a reason these institutions exist, right? There's a reason there's global, you know, a whole diversity of spiritual pursuits and traditions. And and we've kind of come through this, you know, I know the three of us are probably a little bit allergic to the whole deconstruction conversation. <laughs> and literally, that's what... Listen, that's what we, we, I mean, when we talked about coming having Justin come on a, like a year ago, we're like, man, he's got some really great perspectives on deconstruction. And then when it finally came time for us to have this conversation, I'm like, so done with it. I'm yeah. kind of over it. Aren't you over it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think as it's relevant to, we're talking about, like, we've talked about that in the past. We don't need to like rehash that, but it's kind of deconstruction season of sorts and what the pandemic did in some ways was like bring that <laughs> to everyone in the way that it disrupts the status quo and gives everyone the second to step back and say like, why am I doing things yes. the way I'm doing it? Why am I working 60 hours a week? Why do I live in this yes. city? Why am I doing this job? What, you know, to ask all these big questions. And now we're kind of coming into this, you know, we're coming out of that pandemic where it's, mm -hmm we're establishing new rhythms 
and it feels like a lot of people are in this space of like okay what's next like how do we mm -hmm. build and if we sort of transition from like deconstruction to reconstruction how do you think about looking forward so like this is kind of where we're at it's a little chaotic yep. people are trying to figure out what do we do with what we had yep um, but if we turn our eyes sort of towards what's next how do you think about that so uh, I, yeah i'll start with this and say uh and, and i'll go hyper religious on the thing and say god is always better than the, what we build for god uh god is always better than what we build for god god is always more than what we build for god, god is always uh there's always more and it always and it's always better than what we build for God. And if I'm serious about God, if I'm serious about the divine, I I assume that I assume that what I make one it doesn't last um, because nothing lasts but the kingdom. Uh, and two, I assume that God is better than the thing I'm building for God, which then leads to like what's the thing that comes next? Um, a couple a, a couple of reflections. One, um, I part of what comes next, hopefully, is the humility to let go. Um, like maybe, maybe a, uh, maybe it's not time to start building yet. Like if you're mm. so damn scared, and a lot of us are, if you're so damn scared, then don't start making something because you're going to be doing it out of anxiety, and that's not going to be a, a good true and beautiful work don't build out of your anxiety just because you have to don't fix out of your anxiety like maybe have the humility to, humility to say i don't i don't know and i need to wait um and maybe part of what comes next isn't a season of and this is specifically for church people and then this is and then there's another uh, part of that um maybe this is a season to just wait um just to, to just wait, to just pay attention, to just listen, uh, and to just reflect. We've been building hmm. since the 1940s. We got, you know, and again, we, like predominantly white, predominantly evangelical mainline folks, we've been building. It's gotten bigger and fancier and cooler and more effective. Then suddenly we're not. So maybe this is, this is the season to not build. And maybe that's part hmm. of what comes next is stop building, for God's sake, literally. And then if you're not one of those cats who's not even an institutionalist, if you're just, if, if you're just, uh, just, that's, I'm, I'm such a jerk. If you're someone who is not a, a, a religious leader, maybe part of what comes next is um, don't wait for the folks who built the last thing to build a new thing. Like pay attention in the same way. They're, they're listening to like the culture around them because they built a thing that no longer has the same effectiveness same power what's going on in you they built it for you it no longer works for you so what if this is a season then to pay attention to what's in you the the number of people right now who are who are like signing up for spiritual direction it's like it's astronomical folks who are going to spiritual leaders who don't have a cultural or institutional allegiance they're just going somewhere because they have this sense of like I, I want to figure I – have, I have these things in me. It sounds like puberty for God's sake. Like, like I, there's something going on in me, and uh, but like I, I have this sense of something in me, but I don't want to I – don't, I don't want to – I don't want to hitch my ride to, to that vehicle. So they're going to spiritual directors because spiritual directors don't have a particular allegiance to – so pay attention to what's going on. Maybe that's part of what's next. Is like instead of ditching, and this is my issue, my my predominant issue with the deconstruction conversation, is deconstruction became entirely about just ditching entire things on a whim and just lighting crap on fire. Okay, not at all deconstruction. Uh, instead of just ditching stuff and lighting things on fire, paying attention, like turning inward, like what is it? Okay, why doesn't it work for you? The, not not like why doesn't it work for the culture? I get that it doesn't. And not like, why is it rife with white supremacy and like toxic masculinity? You may be right about that. You might be 40, it doesn't matter. It's like for you personally, if it matters, so turn inward. Like, what do you need? What do you want? Mm -hmm. If this thing matters broadly to you, like what do you need instead for you personally? 
So maybe it's a season instead in which we pay attention and we listen instead of build something or tear something down. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I had a, a conversation with Bradley Jersak the other day and he's a um, kind of Orthodox theologian, author, teacher up in Canada. And he made this really excellent point that we can so easily define ourselves by what we are no longer. We're an X something. And he'll talk to people and they'll say like, oh, I left the church like 12 years ago. And you'll say, well, did you? Because it sounds like it's still, that thing still gets a lot of the right to define you. Yeah. Because you can, you can be defined by being part of something, but you can also be defined by no longer being it, which is still this kind of like photo negative mm -hmm. definition where you haven't actually like moved into something and that's that's something i've always loved about um walking this out with landon is like landon you at some point where we've talked about it a couple times on the podcast like you were in some of those spaces and it was nice to make connection and hear different perspectives but that tends to be uh more common than we think maybe because we're so used to tying our identities to the group like we, mm -hmm. we um, abdicate that radical responsibility of inward searching to the flock, yep. whether that flock is, uh, you know, orthodox or heretic or whatever. Like we still go, you guys get to determine, decide who I am because I don't want the scary responsibility of trying to figure out what's going on inside of me and what am I for and what do I actually believe? And because, to some degree, because, which goes back to the conversation about institutionalism, is once you say, once you publicly say, or even internally come to, the, to come to a conclusion about something you believe, you are now responsible to that thing. Like there's an ownership mm -hmm. piece. And I totally get it. Watching folks who've been responsible to the things they believed about who God is and how God works here in America – I don't, I mean, I, I am, <laughs> but like, I don't want to be one of those cats. Like if I'm someone who hasn't been, I don't want to be one of those cats just trying to like hold on to that institution as it like is like shredded to bits. Like, because once you own a thing and you're responsible for it, if it doesn't work or you're partially wrong, at least partially wrong, then you own that too. That's hard mm -hmm. to come to. And part of what you're getting to, Ryan, there's, um, you know, there's language in the, in the contemplative tradition um, something along the lines of like trans. I was trying to type it out just now because I, I couldn't remember the exact phrase, but it's something along the lines of like transcend and include, um, which is another issue I've had with <laughs> the deconstruction movement. Is it's um, uh, the places you have been are still part of who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, the people you used to love, your ex wife, your ex husband, your abusive dad, your like just the worst aspects of your history your abuses are an aspect of who you are and as awful as that is it is a fundamental human reality the places you've been are part of who you are in the gospels when christ is raised from the dead and i love this as a teaching on multiple levels and not just not just as like a some sort of a apologetic for uh the incarnation but i love that um it, it's made clear that this person, this Jesus body, bears the scars of, uh, of his death. So if, if Thomas can touch the wounds in Jesus' side and on Jesus' wrist, that means that the resurrected body of Christ, like the whole glory, if all history comes down to this moment in the resurrected Christ, this is a body that's actually still scarred by its past. Um, that's, a, that's a tough, uh, that's a tough, actual human teaching about actually knowing that like you might have transcended your past but that doesn't have that but there's nothing about you that actually doesn't belong to your past still so maybe mm -hmm. like you said ryan like maybe you don't go to church anymore yeah but homie you used to like you like you used to and that's still that's still an aspect of who you are and the the way you practice your life and the things you believed while you were there are ingrained in your emotional DNA. And that's still an aspect of who you are as a human being. 
Mm. That's that's at once uh, a thing I wish, just like you do. I wish folks didn't just say like I used to, you know, I used to go to church, and now I don't, and so I'm now this completely other thing. Which like there's no conversation to be had there. And it's also mm. the fear I it's also the fear I wish was eradicated from the hearts and the minds of those who are invested in what comes next with regards to religious practice institutionally and otherwise is you will not be what you were before but that does not mean that you have to let it all go and start from entirely and completely scratch we've learned Mm. so much in the last 55 years of building the things we've built take a minute settle down pay attention to what happened in the past and in the last few years and then from the rubble and your own inspiration, then get to work and build something beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to pose this question to both of you. We've talked about this a little bit in past episodes too. Um, there's historically been, at least in these uh, strains of Christianity, kind of hyper emphasis on belief. And once those doctrines and dogmas are, like you said, institutionalized and they're kind of like set in stone, so to speak, uh, there was this kind of collision course with an increasingly pluralistic, diverse world that people are now exposed to more than ever. And it seems like they're looking back at this thing and it's seeming more and more narrow. And one thing that Ryan and I've talked a lot about is that, you know, this idea of sacredness and that the real like beauty is in participation in whatever your tradition is, or whether you're in a historical tradition or not, this idea of the experiential, the communal, this kind of participation in, in transforming ourselves and this, a little bit of this de-emphasis on belief, but, I wonder, and that, that seems to be, even in the deconstruction movement, a lot of that, like, well, I'm out kind of like binary, the, like the way that switch gets flipped yep. was because of, I think a lot of people had been raised or had been in those cultures that kind of said, like, it's all or nothing you accept, which is a lot of how politics has kind of taken on that that approach, right? Like you're for us or you're against us. And if you're for us, you agree with these 35 (laughs) statements and policies, right? There's no, there's not this nuance of participation and evolution. And so what I want to pose to the two of you is how do you see Christianity in particular in America? How do you see that relationship with belief and this idea that, because it's not, I don't think the answer, even in my current position, I don't think the right answer is like, we just chuck it out and everyone's a like universalist spiritualist, right? Like all the traditions have something to offer. Um, but how do you think about that? Like, uh, I think, we've, yeah. I think what, we, I think what I, what I believe matters. Uh, I think what, yeah. what a person believes matters. I think mm-hmm. um, I'll, I'll go through the back door. Part of what we've come to, and so I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from, well, I'm, I'm borrowing a lot from um, from people like Jamie Smith. Um, you know, it used to be thought we've been wrong about the way the human brain works. <laughs> like, where, like, if I, in, in essence, we've been wrong about the way the human brain works. Sorry, science wins when we talk about the brain. And the idea that I believe something and therefore I do, that's just wrong. Like, I practice my way into the things that I believe. That that's actually how the human brain works. I like hmm. evolutionarily, interpersonally. The things I believe have have come to their solidity, at least, because of practice and because of uh, yeah, because of practice and because of actually. So you know, Jamie, I think the book is imagining the kingdom. You know, he, he, he'll talk about like you can preach all the sermons you want about participation, the cultural participation, but if you're but if if all you but if what happens on Sunday mornings is you're up in front of people, there's a person in front of people, and they're all literally sitting on their butts. Like the way you practice that has way more information in it than the sermon you're preaching. So what you're telling them is like you get to participate in culture and in life and et cetera, but you're but you're the one doing all the work while they sit and watch you to do it. That's more that's more yeah. formational. Yeah. 
uh, we've been wrong about the way that the human the human brain works. Um, which leads me to this is when this when the pastor from up front preaches the things that um, the or preaches from the things in him that he assumes sometimes she bless America um, like wishes that we all believed or assumes we all believe. If you've got a church of a hundred people, first of all, nice job. Secondly, uh, if you've got a church of a hundred people, you'd find maybe three to seven people who are like in full blown, like actual philosophical theological alignment. There's the divergence all over the place. Mm -hmm. So belief matters because there's a conversation we had there, but it's never been and shouldn't be the actual gateway through which people enter into a relationship with one another. Mm -hmm. That ends up being the shift. Like it yeah, matters, like but it's not the thing that primarily matters. Um, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter as much as belonging. A belief matters, but it doesn't matter as much as, and I'm so sorry to do this, but it's actually, uh, by, it, belief matters, but it doesn't matter as much as the conversations that happen in the context of belief. Belief matters, but it doesn't matter as much as, <laughs> belief today matters, but it doesn't matter as much as what I will believe about myself long-term 2015, you know, 15, 20, 30, 35 years from now. It can't be the gateway anymore through it, through which we ask people to enter into community participation in, in religion. What I believe, the conclusions we come to, they matter. They just matter so much less than we've made them. Hmm. Brian? What was the question again? Like, how does belief uh, – the question <laughs> – oh, go ahead. Um. Yeah, a, a few things. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with what, what a lot of Justin said. Like for me, as you were, as you guys were both talking, I was thinking about um, some some research that I've seen. It was actually Landon's wife that was sharing it with me a few years ago about the primary the values. Of, she's, Shout out to Allison. That's cute. She's great, man. You did it. Best life. Um, she was sharing about primary values in generations hmm. and basically the theory goes like you know the greatest generation those who like kind of came back from the war um are they're really big on loyalty so they came back they bought an oldsmobile and nowadays when you see a town and country rolling down the street you know almost without doubt stereotypically who's driving that car you know hmm. and then um the next generation the boomers you know, our parents, maybe, I mean, I guess not your folks, Justin, would they be the kind of boomer greatest generation cusp? They're right in the between. So like my mom yeah. will turn 80 this year. Yeah. Okay. So boomers, uh, because they were the first generation post-war to grow up with as an awareness, all of this could go away tomorrow. Um, security is their primary value. Hmm. So they joined a church community, a town, didn't go anywhere, worked the job 30 years, golden handshake, and they were really good at it. Like they changed the world and they connected us all. And a lot of that, at least in part, was developed because of this like anxious fear that we have to stave off the apocalypse, yep. the, the negative version of apocalypse, as opposed to what I used <laughs> earlier. Um, I don't remember – from what Allison told me, there wasn't an opinion on Gen X, so I'm sorry, Justin. That sounds, like, that sounds very Gen X, actually. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but for millennials, it was authenticity. So we we grew up with these boomer parents who were very successful and said, you could do anything you want, and you should do anything you want. Yeah. So we all went to college, and we got art degrees or philosophies degrees, and then we got into a world where – that's not true. And, you know, like we're the first generation to make less money than our parents. We change careers more, which has almost as much to do with the changing world around us. But we, we knew what we grew up with was inauthentic and, and kind of false. And we weren't buying that, but we're still struggling with figuring out what is authentic. And so authenticity is mm -hmm. our primary value. And then Gen Z, it's straight up uh, the speed of access to information is their primary value. What do I need today? 
just to get through it because they're like being digital natives. They are just, they have lived in this world. Like we remember a world pre 9-11, for example, and they don't. We remember a world pre iPads and phones and they don't. Um, but I've, I've thought about that in the sense of like why there are so few boomers in my church community. And when I listen to the kind of primary voices from that, uh, that group, like Billy Graham on, when I hear the songs, I think songs speak so much to our values. And I think it's really out of our values that we shape our beliefs, right? So what uh, our values set us up for what I want to believe, what I don't want to believe, yep. what I feel like I should believe or shouldn't. Um, and when I hear songs like Blessed Assurance, Upon the Solid Rock I Stand, I think there was a generation that came into religious spaces with the expectation, I need to be told that I'm okay. Yep. In the sense of like, I've already arrived and I don't have to mm -hmm. worry. Uh, if this all goes away tomorrow, I get to go to heaven and be with Jesus when I die. I just, I, I don't want to do the work. I just want to be reminded I'm already in. And I think our generation, we grew up, a lot of us grew up in that kind of religion and went, I'm not so sure. Or we noticed there's a radical disconnect between the things that we sing and the things that we say and how we're actually living our lives, how we actually yep. treat one another, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat our enemies, where I think to... You know, again, there's always exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, there was a significant portion of that previous generation. They didn't invite the kinds of questions that examined the gap between belief and practice because it was an overemphasis on belief. And so my, my response to the question is like, I think at the least we're examining the gap between mm -hmm. belief and the material way we present ourselves to the world. Um, and, and even part of that, I think, is recent research that suggests the God that you don't believe in anymore still has a hold on your values and your desires. So even if intellectually you make the ascent, oh, I don't believe in God anymore, whatever God you don't believe in, in the same way, like being an, an X, whatever, that because the very concept of God is what we've, Lan and I have defined as like the highest ideal. Yep. That highest ideal still has a, a hold on you, whether or not you've come to terms with that. Yep. So it's like you have to do the work either way. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? And but I think that that's that's the that's the awesome responsibility in front of all of us is to slowly close the gap between what it is that I say that I believe or even what I say that I don't believe anymore and how I actually live my life. Yeah. There's that old, um, and by old, I mean the 1980s um, analogy that every pastor, youth pastor I know has used at some point um, and I, uh, in, uh, about the, the tightrope walker uh, and with the wheelbarrow. You guys know this thing? The tightrope walker who's like yes. str strings a tightrope up and, and like walks across it and people cheer and, and then he grabs a wheelbarrow and walks across it and uh, he says, you, you know, do you think, do you think I can walk across this tightrope with a wheelbarrow, a wheelbarrow and someone in it? And everyone says, yes. And then he says, okay, who's going to get in? And no one moves. Um, the, if there's a movement with regards to, if there's a movement with regards to faith in faithful, wise leaders in religious context about belief, it's going to be, it's going to be practice oriented that that ascribing mentally emotionally to the like Atlanta said the 35 things like here's the 35 things people are like I can't I've got to six I'm done whatever I just let me have the donut <laughs> um it it will be about practice uh it'll be about like being able to be in the wheelbarrow and actually trusting the wheelbarrow and actually trusting the thing not trusting the 35 things, but actually trusting like the wire, the person pushing it. Like it'll be about practice. If, if there's something to be done around the, around belief in the next season of religious life together, it'll be practice oriented or I think it'll miss. Yeah. Yeah. When I think about 
there's the, you know there's that that moment in the gospel where um, I think Jesus is healing this man's son, and he says, "Do you believe I can do this?" And he hmm. says, "Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief." And it's like it's this amazing moment of like the the transparency of cognitive dissonance, which I think is the thing that we have to reclaim and. Even like, and I, I think this is, it's not a, it's not a Christian thing. It's not even a religious thing. It's to say, um, I believe in love and I also don't believe in love. Yes. Like it, I, I believe in being a generous person, but I don't act like it. And I need to be honest with that, uh, the, that divide between my ideology. You know, it, we've, we've talked about it before, like, oh my gosh, like critiquing conservative ideologies is like shooting fish in a barrel, but we can see it. We can see it on the left as well. Like we believe in inclusion of everybody except for those people who aren't as inclusive as we are. And and we believe, and, and we dehumanize the, so it's that lack of self-reflectiveness. Um, and, and to me, like, I think practice, like you're saying is the thing that to be reclaimed that moves us forward. But I think that ability to be self-reflective, to hold these complex cognitive dissonances we have to say, we all believe things and we also don't believe them, but we want to close the gap towards the good, which requires a tremendous amount of, you know, humility and not shame in the sense that it sends us into a cycle of despair, but something that actually like lights a little bit of a fire under our ass to go, man, I've got some actual work to do. Yep. Yep, I bet. Um, I want to, I want to put you on one of my favorite soapboxes that you get on, Justin. Oh, because I think you have some really great perspectives on this, and we we haven't talked about it in a while, so it'd be it'd be cool to hear where you're at now. Um, it's v- very easy to be critical of online spaces right now, especially again during the pandemic. We were all online; it seemed like a great idea at the time, and maybe that wasn't so great, <laughs> you know. So we talk a lot about like. We find ourselves in echo chambers and Mm -hmm. we are so subservient to algorithms now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that little piece from uh, Bo Burnham where he is like on stage at uh, like a, like a Google or something. And he's like, all these machines are out to get you. And uh, I, I, I've been researching recently this idea of limbic capitalism. It's like where where we used to try to gobble up, physical property now we try to gobble up attention yes and everything behind that mechanism is about shaping you know reinforcing what you believe you're on the right side here's all the stuff that gives you the slant or whatever yep i you have helped me so much to gain a more nuanced perspective of what's happening with online spaces um in in saying especially like social media is still a teenager so we still don't know what it is and how it works and it's a little bit it just got its driver's license. Um, <laughs> it really did. So how do you, what how do you see in this whole conversation? I think especially around the idea of community. What what can what uh, what's happening right now with the online space, and yeah. what would you hope to see? Or, I think or, we're getting and, tired. And, and, okay, that's a, I think that's the thing that's the, the dominant experience of of online spaces is is some form of annoyance and, and or exhaustion like it's that is a thing that you like across the board if you ask folks about like their favorite space whatever there there are some platforms that might be different i don't know if people are like sick of snapchat because it's just different uh or but like um not that like i know anything about snapchat <laughs> um but like i think that the dominant experience folks are having uh, is annoyance and some form of exhaustion of being tired that's that's i think what's happening um what i want um and what i what i coach people towards and and encourage people towards like don't i I don't want you to leave like don't leave just know where you are like you don't like if you need to leave for a minute to get some perspective on where you are fantastic but please come back because there's so many people here who like who need folks here who know where they are so don't leave just know where you are so Bo Burnham's thing is genius. Uh, he's just fantastic on so many levels. But his, his like he's yeah. like these are these are 
these are platforms that are designed by people who have agendas that you can't get around that. Like it didn't, it wasn't that like no one like stumbled across Instagram. It was built by people <laughs> who had a particular set of agendas and whose entire livelihoods, there's a building with employees who maintain this thing and they lose their jobs if it doesn't work. So they have to keep it working and you're the thing that keeps it working. They have an agenda. So know that when you're there, know that it isn't just a thing that exists on your damned phone. Someone built it just like someone built anything. And, the, and because they built it, they want to sell it. Know that going in. Quit pretending like this is a reality. It's not. This is a tool. This is a, a place. Be here. Just know where it is you are while you're here. Like that's that's like the ball. It's not going away. There'll be another another. We're not gonna we're not gonna suddenly become this luddite culture where like oh my gosh we're exhausted <laughs> everyone's offline. No, because what happened when people were scared the hell not scared when people were, like people were like pissed at uh, Elon Musk and and they were for like three minutes. Um, at Twitter, they're like, oh, I'm, screw this. And they didn't leave the platform entirely. They complained on the platform about the platform. And then they talked about the other platforms they were going to. I'm like, guys, someone else owns that one. And he might be a jerk too. Like, know where you are when you're there. That's my whole thing about being online. Like, know, know where you are when you're there. Is Do you think that, our online persona is a part of who we are or an extension of who we are or a projection of who you are? Like what's the relationship to who we are? Um, I think it is, it works a little bit like cocaine. Like it enhances aspects of your personality. Uh, like it, it's not, that's not, not in you. Uh, if that's a thing that you're capable of uh, behind the keyboard, that's in you. It's, it is again, it's apocalyptic in that way. It turns out, you're a bigot. Turns out you don't love your neighbor. Turns out, I mean, like it, it, it allows for a certain kind of exposure so that, you know, you, you and I earlier were talking about the, you know, the, the, the old adage, like in question, self-reflective question, like who, who are you when no one's looking? It's fascinating the way uh, our online platforms actually answer some of that question for us. Because if you're alone and it's 2.35 in the morning, the things you're angry about are actually things you're angry about. The things you're sad about are things you're actually sad about. And how you express them, those things are actually in you. So part of what we figured out <laughs> with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, is like that's actually who you are when no one's looking. Because you were by yourself with your phone and you did that. Hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely an aspect, an expression of who I am as a person. So how about the same question, but for community then, like, can we actually have online community? Is mm -hmm. it an extension of real community or potentially distraction? Like what's the relationship between like with actual yeah. human relationship? I think this is, so this is, this is far less conclusion than it is reflection. Um, it's, I think it might, might be as how I should probably say it. I think on online community is slash might be fundamentally different than actual community. Um, I'm having a conversation with, uh, with David Taylor, who's a, um, he's a theologian from, uh, from Fuller and his most recent book is about, is about embodiment. Um, mm -hmm. And he, along with a whole lot of other people, mostly not within the, the, the evangelical tradition have been reflecting over the last, seven to 15 years about the like the essential nature of having a body um uh, and there's a whole other thing there about like how does an evangelical tradition who buys the notion of the incarnation not be about the body i don't know but we did um yeah but like uh the there is something about actually being in physical space and i only say it that way because i don't understand the physiology um but if i'm gonna be a wise curator of actual community part of what i've come to and this is somewhat recent is i really do need to understand more about actual physiology and what actual physical proximity means 
and does for people. Why is it mm -hmm. different? Why is it different for me to be in a physical room with someone than it is to do this? Like, why is that actually different? If I want to curate actual communal, communal spaces, I really should understand brain science like more comprehensively than I, than I, this is me. I should understand brain science more than I do. Because we have church leaders all over America who for the last three years have been like trying their butts off to get people to regather in spaces, took advantage of the pandemic moment to gather people online and don't know the difference between the two things. Yeah, you really should. Because there really is a yeah. fundamental difference between being in physical space. So it, are online communities possible? Yes. Are they fundamentally different? Yeah. And because I don't know the difference, I can't really tell you what need it is that online spaces fill versus what need it is that physical proximity fills and why those things are different. Mm -hmm. But it's time to learn. I didn't watch a whole lot of Exops files growing up, but the episode I remember being the scariest was these people that upload like they they uh was it mully and sculder went, went or sculder and nope scully Mulder and scully <laughs> i wanted you to go through more iterations of the mixture of their <laughs> names just saying the same thing over and over again no, muddy, and and Mully. muddy and skull face i think that's it. that them yes they went to this trailer in the woods and it was like it smelled like death and they were it was just like it was horrid and there was like huge motherboards everywhere and they come around the corner and there's these three bodies that had been linked up to the computer that were like hanging there decomposing these yeah. people had like uploaded their consciousness consciousnesses to the internet and that was in like 1997 you know <laughs> it's like early it's uh, not... black mirror episode basically yeah, yeah it's like <laughs> yeah we're kind of at that point maybe yeah <laughs> Yeah, the having I mean, again, like you know, coming back to, and this is this is part of the the thing that keeps me uh, keeps me. This is part of what uh, this is an aspect of what continues to move me to uh, to and about the person of Christ is uh, the emphasis on the physicality of Jesus. Uh, just like how potent that teaching is uh, now. The, the to the, it is the thing it is the thing that we missed uh it's the thing that we're it's the thing that we missed during the pandemic uh and the and part of how we know that and this i'm not a social psychologist uh i'm just paying attention is it you know it part of how we know it is the thing we missed is is like we all met online for a year and a half and no one was happy like we mm. we met online for a year and a half and everyone still came out like unhappy there's a there's a there's a and this is not just this county but there's a county in in pennsylvania one of the one of the most church saturated counties in the entirety of america and i can't remember which it's uh, uh it's in pennsylvania i'm gonna i'll remember after the podcast um and 67 percent of the people who left their congregations during or couldn't attend their their church gatherings during the pandemic did not return after it was over 67 wow. percent wow. wow you could go back when we opened the doors and you didn't we missed each other physically like we missed we were online and and it didn't meet that need it didn't meet like the being with each other need and it, instead it exposed the actual needs we have about connection and then when we had the option talk about apocalypse when we had the option to go back and reconnect in the ways that we were connecting before because we were so hungry for that kind of connection we were able to say that still doesn't meet my need mm. man mm. that's a real that's a like a real life apocalyptic moment yeah <laughs> they didn't come back to the thing we had when they had the option after us providing this thing i mean Online spaces are different. Uh, physical space matters, and I just don't think we've—I don't think we've done the work. I know I haven't. I don't think we've culturally, institutionally done the work to figure out the difference and why the difference matters either. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit more now. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Landon, you want to wrap us up? Yeah. Um, yeah, Justin, tell us what it is you're 
working on? What's your focus these days? What's coming up? What can people, where can we find you? What can we look forward to? Yeah. Um, Justin menu. <laughs> um, I am uh, releasing a book in May called Sacred Strides. Uh, that's my primary work focus. Um, it's about the rhythm and tension between uh, work and rest. Um, excited about the book. Um, I am, in the meantime, uh, I'm revamping my own podcast space. I'm, I'm writing every day to post to Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, and I'm making music with my 12-year-old son. <laughs> um he's pretty great um the but in in the midst of all of it uh i'm do i'm i am doing the work of uh i turned 49 today is the what 11th so i turned i turned 49 on uh on january 1st and i joked leading up to the to my to the 49 like it's my it's my jubilee year so i now have to literally sell all of my crap and uh, <laughs> give it back to people. Get it reset. But I, I really, uh, and, and as soon as I told a joke, I actually got serious about it. Is um, I'm spending the entirety of this year re-examining everything. Um, mm. So I write, I write books. I like writing books. I've got a publishing deal. Um, I'm doing that. That the like, what's it for? Like for what? Like, what's the mm. point? of that, uh, about kind of everything. So I signed a book contract. This is the second book of that contract. So you're deconstructing? And... <laughs> no. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. I don't want to punch you. I Damn it, Landon. So we hard. went so far. <laughs> and that's a wrap. Thanks. Had it in. He hit Landon in the jaw <laughs> with a crowbar. Uh, I, like I'm gonna do the work uh, this year of reexamining like the 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 why I do what I do, mm. uh, and reattach. Um, it's more like a it's more it's more of a detangling in reattachment because I I love the stuff I do, um, but that's but because I love doing it doesn't mean I get to do it or should do it publicly or professionally. And mm. so with books, with music, with church life, um, with spiritual direction with coaching like what's this for is like that's what i'm actually that's what i'm actually really up to over the next like seven to ten months um so i'll drop a book i'm excited about it it's a really good book i'm i i, I think people will, will dig it and benefit from it um and uh and i will spend between now and when it comes out honestly evaluating like what's the what's this all for that's my – that's what I'm really up to. Come yeah, well, me. maybe we can join <laughs> you in that uh, – the pursuit of that uh, answer or the pursuit of that question. Or amen and amen. we want to think about yeah. it, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks well, for the time, guys. Justin, thanks for coming on. This was so great. Um, love my you dearly. Pleasure. You've meant the world to me. me. Too, you've meant the world to, to us even though this is the first time you and Landon have first met because you've been – uh, just kind of in the background of this whole project. So appreciate cool. you, man. Happy to be here. Thank you. All right. Later. See ya.